<laughs> it's time for ArcGIS Pro Bowl 2.7. Woo! Very exciting. Yeah. And we got a huge matchup for today's game. If I can advance the slide, here we go. Because my team, the mighty Mark Mercators, are going to take on the spectacular Samaya Spheroids. Uh, I don't know. Lamoids is probably more like <laughs> it. But we'll see how it goes. And this is how the game is going to be played. So we want to show you some of the cool new features of ArcGIS Pro 2.7. And we're going to do it through a series of three plays. Uh, the first play is going to be a touchdown. So this is going to be the game changer. You're going to score seven points. This is something that will change your life and make your workflows a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Next, we're going to have a QB quarterback sneak. And that is just going to be a little functionality that we've snuck in into a capability that you probably already use. There we go. And then the third one will be a trick play. So it's kind of like a little tip and trick. It's something little that they've added in, but again, something that you'll probably find really cool and be able to use um, in your workplace as well. So I think, Samaya, you won the coin toss and you have elected to receive. So I'm going to pass the ball to you and you can take over the field. Thank you, Mark. Okay, spheroids, let's get into our touchdown play right away. So what we're looking at here is the 2016 and 2006 biogeoclimatic ecosystem classification zones for BC. So in this map, we've got the 2016 zones. And in this map, we have the 2006 zones. And what you'll notice is both of the maps kind of look very similar. And what I want to know is where have these zones changed and how have they changed? Now, in the past, this process was very manual and very visual. But in 2.7, we have introduced a new tool called the Spatial Association Between Zones tool. And what that does is it quantifies the associations between zones in two maps, both spatially and categorically. But before we get into this tool, let's get to business. I have some theory to go over. Okay, so to illustrate how this tool works, um, we'll be using this simple example. So the tool first gives us um, a few outputs, but we're going to be first looking at local correspondence. So it overlays two maps and compares map A zones uh, to map B zones, and then compares map B zones to map A zones. So for the red zones in map A, it looks at map B and says, okay, there's only one zone type, in this case, the purple one, that falls within the area of the red zone. So there is a high local correspondence. Now that's a one-to-one -one comparison. So we can say the same thing for our orange zone and also the same thing for our blue zone. Next, what the tool does is it overlays uh, map B with map A. So in our purple zone, there are actually two zone types that fall in that area. So we can say that there is a low correspondence. Now, if there were, let's say, four zones um, in map A, then that would uh, equate to an even lower correspondence. And for our yellow zone, that's going to get another high local correspondence. So overall, these two maps match pretty well, but there is a low correspondence uh, between A and B in that purple zone. So overlaying all the local correspondence in both maps, this tool can help us identify um, those local differences. And it does that through a bivariate relationship symbology. So in this example, any region that is marked high, high and has that light gray color means that there is a good match of zones between map A and B. And any region that's marked low, high with that pink color, that just means that there is a good match um, from map A to map B, but there is not a good match from map B to map A. So let's get to our tool and let's get to our example. So again, here we are looking at our 2016 zones, and that can be our map A, and our 2006 zones, that can be our map B. 
So if I open up the tool, um, my input is going to be those 2016 zones and the categorical zone field that I'm going to be using are my present zones. Um, for the map and the layers that I want to overlay on top, I'm going to use that 2006 data and use the past zones as my categor categorical overlay zone field. So as I mentioned before, um, you get a few uh, outputs from this tool. So another output that you get is the a global measure of spatial association. And what this value is, is, is a value between zero to one. And in this case, if the value is greater to one, that just means that both maps are very, very similar. Um, so here we can see that that is the case, but there are a few differences. So let's take a look at those local correspondence values and see where those differences are. So I'm going to turn um, my output layer on. You can see it's got that same bivariate uh, symbology. And here we're looking at an area where you can clearly see uh, there have been quite a few changes. So let's zoom in onto uh, this pink area right here. Um, and what that's telling us is in 2006, uh, this zone was much larger, but in 2016, it broke down into more zones and the area that's highlighted through the pink is where they stayed the same um, when in uh, 2016. So another output that you get are charts with this tool uh, that show you where those categorical zone changes occur. So here we have more so uh, spatial differences, but if we take a look at this chart, I'll bring that in. We're gonna be able to see um, where uh, zones have changed and which zones have changed into what. So if I go ahead and select the spruce willow birch zone, um, we can see between 2006 and 2016, 80% of that zone stayed the same. But if I hover over um, the Boreal Altai zone, we can see that between 2006 and 2016, there was a 15% change of those zones turning into the spruce um, willow birch zone. Okay, team, now let's get into our trick play. So here you can see I'm just um, labeling uh, my interior mountain heather alpine zone. And what, what we've introduced in 2.7 is a new font type, and that is known as an open variable font type. So um, if you're already on Windows 10, um, uh, you should have the bond shrift um, variable font type already installed in Pro and ready to go. And you can differentiate the variable font type with a little V you'll notice on the font icon. So I'm just going to switch to that. And what you'll notice is a new drop, drop down appears. And through this drop down is where I can really customize um, the width and the weight of this font. Now, um, you can also bring in a variable font type that you have downloaded. So I also have this pathway extreme font type. And what you'll notice is I have a few more options that I can customize, including the optical size and the slant of my font. Okay, team. And I think it's now time for our sneak play. And that has to do with pop-ups. So what you'll notice right off the bat are there are some changes in the um, how the pop-ups are set up. So there are alternating gray and white colors so you can differentiate those fields. If you don't like this, don't worry. You can go into the options um, in your pro project and change it to the classic setting. Something else that is super cool is if you have an attachment, an image that is a 360 image, 
you can now open that up in a 360 image viewer and it will look something like this. Ooh, ah, super cool. Okay, something else that we've snuck in is um, before, if you had an attachment, this text would have defaulted to just an italic text. You wouldn't be able to change it. But now you have the option to go into the caption and change the font, um, the text size or the text size. Something else that we have also snuck in here is an HTML mode. So that really um, allows you to customize the look and feel of your text, or in this case, I'm gonna change up our fields. Um, I can go in, you know, make a, a few changes, or um, I'm just gonna paste in uh, some HTML code. We'll give it a nice refresh. And now you can see I have changed um, some colors and some bolding. Um, and really made my uh, pop-up, uh, the look and feel that I want. Okay, team, we went through our three plays. Let's beat the Mercators. I know we can. I don't know about that. I mean, I got some pretty <laughs> cool things to show too, all right? So slow <laughs> we'll your roll. See. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, it's my turn to show a touchdown play. And what I did is I did something really, really sneaky. I stole Samaya's data. So I have the same classification zones that she used. And what I want to do is I am going to zoom in to a particular area to show you feature and layer blending. This is actually something that Heather mentioned, but let's give it a, a look-see in real terms here. So I have those zones and underneath I got some terrain data that I grabbed from the Living Atlas. And I really want to be able to see both. I want to be able to uh, uh, be able to see the um, the uh, the terrain underneath those colors. Now, in order to do that, I do have to kind of move the screen here a little bit. Um, I will go into that particular layer and change the appearance. Now, in the past, if I had to do this, I would use the transparency to do that, right? And it kind of fades the colors. It's not exactly ideal. So what I've done instead is I now through 2.7 can use this layer blend option where we have a number of preset ways to be able to lighten the colors or darken the colors between layers. So maybe I want to choose a lighter color and you can see how the terrain really shows up with that lightened mode or can try to do a darker color, maybe a linear burn. And then you'll really be able to see those colors pop amongst the um, uh, amongst the dialogue. So that's something that is really a, a cool way to be able to uh, show your maps in both 2D and in 3D. So again, same idea, I've got this uh, 2D um, GeoTIFF uh, that I've downloaded and it's on top of a typical 3D base map with a dark gray. And again, I can use that layer blend. We have lightning modes, we've got darkening modes, but we also have some modes that do a bit of both, such as vivid light which allowed you to accentuate the darkness, to be able to lighten the lightness and uh, kind of mix and blend uh, those two principles. So you can really see those features pop uh, when you change that particular uh, blend. You can also blend features within the same layer. And I'm gonna do that with some wildfire data that I downloaded. Um, so these are just perimeters of wildfires that have occurred over the last 100 years. And we can see the footprints of where these wildfires have occurred, but we don't really have any idea of where there's any overlapping perimeters. So that's where fleet feature blend comes in. So again, I can use the same kind of color principles to be able to show what that looks like. I'm gonna choose multiply. And now you will be able to clearly show where those overlapping perimeters are within this map. So I think that's a pretty cool way to be able to illustrate that type of data. And it's just with a simple mouse click. All right, time for my little tip and trick. Um, we're, we're again looking at those zones and I just use some typical color ramp for these uh, colors, uh, unique values. So nothing really special, but I did notice online that the province has a, a graphic to uh, that should illustrate those zones in the colors that they want. So what I did is I've added that particular um, graphic as a graphic layer in ArcGIS Pro. And the reason why I wanna do that is Maybe I want to use these same colors. 
So again, Heather kind of mentioned this, is the ability to have an eyedropper. And this is basically uh, something that is uh, found no matter where you change your color. So I can use that eyedropper, go to the color that I really want for that particular zone, and then it will just change it. So that saves a lot of time and effort being able to copy and paste hex codes and color codes and all that. You can now use the eyedropper just like with most other graphics programs. It's now available in ArcGIS Pro, so that's cool. And one final quick sneak play. And the sneak play I'm going to show is um, that they've added in in the exploratory 3D analysis menu, the ability to create an, ele an elevation profile interactively. So all you need to do is just kind of digitize a line on your 3D scene. I'll just do a quick little line here, get a little mountain, get a little flatness, and it will generate that elevation profile for you on the fly. And you don't need any special licensing for this. Anybody can do this. I'm just using a 3D base map. And then you have the chance to be able to upload this as an image and put it into your layouts or whatever. So a cool little trick. Uh, well, it's more of a sneak. And I don't know about you, Samaya. I think that is a pretty spectacular uh, set of uh, tools that we just showed in 2.7. I totally agree, and I cannot believe you stole my play. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> let's take a look at um, my playbook and what we went through. So first we had our touchdown play, and that was those categorical and spatial differences between two maps using the spatial association between zone stool. Then we had our little trick play where I told you about a new variable fonts that you can use to customize your labeling a little bit more. And then we had our little sneaky play with those better pop-ups to really customize the look and feel um, of your pop-ups. Right, and I just really quick, all I did with mine is uh, be able to uh, use the eyedropper, uh, to take advantage of those layer and feature blends, and also to uh, take advantage of that elevation profile. Okay, so there are so many more things that we could have went into, and here are a few highlights that if you have time, please check out and take a look. Yeah, the same thing goes. Uh, there's a, a, other cool things that we've noticed along the way. I know Samai is really excited about filtering geoprocessing history, which is just so exciting. <laughs> so bookmark folders, that's my, uh, that's my cool little uh, addition as well. There's a ton more. A lot of this is outlined in documentation. There's a bunch of videos out there as well. So take advantage of that. Mm -hmm.